Uh, my name is Jonathan Briggs. I'm one of the law librarians here at Fort Bend County Law Library, and this is uh, our attorney lecture series, uh, uh, a series of lectures that we put on featuring attorneys speaking on various topics uh, of concern and interest to both our pro se parties and to attorneys uh, for professional development and education as well. So we're uh, pleased to have Cynthia Rendon here, uh, uh, Sugarland attorney. Uh, she has lectured before and we're pleased to have her back again. She is a regular here at the law library doing her research and so forth. And she's been a supporter of us uh, so we're very pleased to have her. Uh, Cynthia has been, I know her Cindy, uh, has been in practice for almost 25 years, uh, started off the big firm route, and uh, then took the brave step of hanging out her own shingle, and has been doing that for a number of years, practicing primarily in family law, but also doing civil litigation, personal injury uh, work. Uh, she's speaking on a topic uh, of interest to attorneys, but I think it applies to a lot of different uh, fields, but definitely to attorneys. It's on attorney burnout. Uh, it's a challenging uh, uh, field of practice. It's a challenging job. Uh, it's not easy generally. And, uh, and so there's a significant amount of attorneys who, uh, whether acknowledged or not, experience burnout. And uh, she's written a book on it. Uh, she graciously donated a copy of it called Judge Me Not. Uh, so she is here to talk about this uh, issue. And uh, again, we're very pleased to have her here. Cindy and I worked together a long time ago uh, when we were a little bit younger. And so uh, I'm glad that we're still in contact and uh, let her take it away. Great. Thanks, Thank Cindy. You. Hi, Oops, here we go. Thank you. Um, wrote a copy of my book. You can also get it on Amazon, but it's Judge Me Not. And it's just my journey of healing from, from burnout. I went a couple of years ago, I went through some massive burnout and, um, it's, it's a road to recovery is all I can say. And I was really fortunate to, to find a good therapist, um, somebody who's local. I do my, my therapy sessions with him via Zoom though for the convenience factor. Um, but I remember, and I talk about it, about it in my book that one of the first things when I went in um, was I don't want to talk about my childhood. You know, that was then, this is me, you know, I'm through all of that. And what I learned through, through this process is a lot of the bad habits that I had as a child, you know, um, some of it, you know, not feeling like you're good enough or, um, you know, striving to being a people pleaser is what, you know, is what it's called, helped me excel academically, helped me get to where I am professionally. But then as an adult, you know, you can't maintain that level of intensity. and I started um, just looking at other areas outside of law that I could practice. And that's when I looked at it and I said, okay, something has to get, I can't continue working like this. I can't continue dreading opening emails. Um, I actually have a reference to the library here on, on page 33, where I was up here doing re legal research. I come up here at least once or twice a month. I, I save up all my research and then I just come up here. Um, with a flash drive and I get the cases and you know, do my research. But I was up here that day doing research. And as I was walking back to my car, my eyes just filled with tears. And I knew that just the thought of having to go back to my office to respond to emails, to, to respond to clients, um, was just too overwhelming. And so it was that day I'd had my therapist um, contact information, Distress Dojo. I'd had his contact information probably for about a month now. But, you know, I, I can do, I can heal myself. I can fix myself. I can, you know, let me just, let me just sleep um, and it'll get better. And I just, I realized that it doesn't, you know, you have to do something. And so part of writing this book is also to normalize getting help because a lot of, you know, there's, there's this stigma about mental health and we don't need to have that. Um, if you need help, if there's a cry for help, you know, Get help. I saw there's a, um, a poet who he wrote um, a lot of times tied to the ankle of I'm doing well is a I need help because you learn to put on a happy face and you learn to say how are you doing oh I'm doing great um, even if you're not and so this writing this book was a healing process for me it was going back through the journey over the past now about two and a half years um, and I'm still working through things but. What's helped me tremendously 
is one talking about it. And that's kind of a side effect of therapy is that you just learn to just overshare. Um, but talking about it and because there's nothing to be ashamed about, you know, you're getting help. And then I still talk to my therapist. Um, he's also a life coach. So in addition to you know the therapy hat of dealing with the past um, and coming up with coping techniques, we're also looking at future. Like, okay, what kind of life do you want to build? Um, and I'm going to take my jacket off. It's hot. So anyway, so we, yeah, so I kind of, I feel like I got like the best of all worlds. I got a therapist and a life coach. Um, but some of the things I have learned, you know, I was like an open border. I had no, no boundaries. Clients, they, had, they excuse me, they had my personal cell, which is like a big no. You don't ever give out your personal cell. When I, you know, when we worked together, I mean, risk managers and they weren't, doctors weren't calling, you know, all the time. You know, they, right. they respected boundaries. Um, but when you start to represent people, you know, doing family law, personal injury, um, especially family law, I mean, it wasn't unusual to, you know, my phone would be blowing up with text messages, you know, 11 o'clock at night um, or on the weekends. And then I just had that personality of, I need to respond to this. Um, and they're sending a message saying, I just don't know if I, you know, my husband's driving me crazy. I don't know if I can handle it. You know, and so your heart, your empathy goes out to them. You're like, let me respond. Let me let me put on my counselor hat. Um, I am not a counselor, so I've also learned, like attorney and counselor, it's not mental health counseling. It is counseling in terms of this is my recommendation. This is what I think. This is the law. This is what I think your judge is going to do. And this is what I recommend. That's the counseling. And so I've had to get out of that mindset of let me fix this because as attorneys, we're so used to fixing things. Um, and so I wanted to help you know fix fix my clients. Um, one of the biggest things for me was having boundaries. And I just, I preach that to everybody. And so some, I talked about some of the boundaries I have in here. And I've actually had a lot of people who've read this who aren't lawyers who are like, this is, you know, even though I know you geared it towards attorneys, there's so much good advice in here that I can apply to myself. Or I see myself going down this road of burnout with my own job. You know, I've had a couple of friends in my neighborhood who have reached out to me um, because they, they, you know, you put your job first. And what I always tell, what I, and I talk about it in my book is, um, when you leave, if you give notice, I mean, they're, they're going to be on the phone to the headhunter, to putting out an ad in Indeed, um, looking for your replacement or at one job I had where I was in house, if whenever people left, they just redistributed the work. And so you were already you know, like, here's my caseload. And now you know, it's even higher. You're not replaceable at home. You're not replaceable with your friends. And so that's something that I really had to work on. And part of that is having the boundaries, having healthy boundaries. Um, so one of the boundaries is I no longer give out my personal cell number. I have a, um, I have a second phone number. I, do, I use it through Google. Super, you know, I, I know how to run my practice on a, on a shoestring. Um, I have a, a Google phone number, and I just route it through. And the nice thing about it is that I get the messages on my desktop. And if there's a voicemail, that comes to my desktop as well, and I can save it to the client file. The other really nice thing about it is I can set do not disturb hours. And so, you know, I can say my my phone will ring during you know, during my business hours. After that. If somebody calls or leaves a text, I don't even know because I don't get an alert on my personal cell. It just everything comes on my lap, you know, on my computer, my inbox. And so that's brought me so just that one change alone has brought so much peace of mind. Because I, you know, I used to have this I'm sitting, you know, watching a movie. I remember and I talk about one instance in here. We were actually at a concert and I had a client message me that it was urgent. She needs to talk to me immediately. And so I stepped out of the concert and I went, you know, and it's loud because you have the music and stuff. And I was in the corner with one, you know, one finger in my ear and I had my phone trying to listen to what my client was saying. And she just wanted to complain. It wasn't urgent. It wasn't anything that couldn't have been addressed during normal business hours. And so that was a huge, huge benefit to separate my phone so that, and then sometimes if I just need to get drafting done, I just put it on do not disturb. So I never even know that I'm getting a phone call um, so I can continue to focus and interrupt it. I think that helps me to have to have this, these set work times. Um, 
it helps me to be more present to my clients so that I'm not burned out, you know, dreading talking to them. Um, or walking around, you know, with tears in my eyes and telling everyone it's just allergies. Um, but another boundary that that I learned to put in place is, and this is a funny way how I learned this boundary. Um, for a while, it's been a year now, actually. Facebook is really nice. It pops up your memories. So some of them are good memories. Some of them, you know, like, um, like a party or, you know, someone's birthday. But this popped up a memory about a year ago as an experiment. You know, do I want to get out of family law? Is this, you know, because um, it is, it's a lot of high emotion. And just go back to doing your insurance defense because, you know, insurance defense is a, it's a low intensity docket. It's a lot of just doing discovery or motions, you know, going to depositions, um, but your phone doesn't really ring that much. And for the most part, you can work, work things out with Rule 11 agreements. You know, opposing counsel will give you 30-day discovery extensions, um, you know, versus in family law, getting a week, you're like scratching and crawling, you know, I just went five days. Um, and I know in, when I did defense work, civil defense work, it was like, give me 30 days, sure, just shoot me over Rule 11, no big deal. Um, so I started working as an of counsel for this other firm, and I just, you know, worked 10 hours a week. But what I did is I blocked off my Tuesdays and my Thursdays. So, okay, I'm going to work on his files only on these days. And I really enjoyed those days because my phone wasn't, you know, if it was ringing, I didn't know. Um, I wasn't living by my email because you never get work done if you're just constantly checking email and responding to emails. And um, those are just nice, quiet, peaceful days. And then the downside to that docket was I was actually making less than I made doing my family law docket. Um, I fell a little behind on some of my drafting. And so I had to hire, I already have a paralegal and I had to hire another contract paralegal who, and this was a good eye opener for me. She actually charged more per hour than what I was getting paid by this other attorney. Mm. And I'm like, okay, I'm crying uncle. I can't do this. Um, Cause he was drowning in work at the time. And needing to get caught up on his files. So it was a lot of quick deadlines. And so I had a trouble integrating it with my docket. Um, but when I had to start paying somebody more, I'm like, okay, I'm losing money now. This is not giving me peace of mind. Um, it was stressful because of those deadlines, but the work itself wasn't stressful. It was just managing the deadlines. But what it also taught me was I need to have block time. And there's tons of books out there that talk about blocking your time. And so I started, and I've continued doing that um, at least two days a week. I will block my time. It's not always Tuesdays and Thursdays, but I try to be consistent with the days I'm blocking. And on those days, I will check my email when I, you know, when I first log in, respond to whatever's come in through the night. And then I take, turn my email off and I just do whatever drafting needs to get done. You know, my drafting orders, final decrees, um, answering discovery, you know, just whatever I haven't been able to get done because I'm in court or in mediation or you know, depositions. Um, and then the other days, I you know respond to phone calls. I schedule consults. I schedule meetings. But I have at least two days that I'm just doing, you know, button chair, doing my written work. I'm not doing consults. I'm not talking to clients. Um, because then you just find yourself never having any downtime, never having a break mentally and emotionally. So those are two big things that helped me. Um, again, I, I just go back to the cell phone. That was, I'm having like flashbacks of getting like, you know, war and peace type text messages. But another thing is that now in my retention agreements and in my email signature block, you know, I, I talk about, um, please allow me 24 to 48 hours to respond. You know, and that's hard for some people because we're so used to instant gratification. Um, but I remind clients like 24 to 48 hours. Um, but in my retention agreement, I also talk about this is what's an emergency. This is what's not an emergency. So like in family law, um, kid not coming back with their swimming suit is not an emergency. Um, there are very few emergencies. I tried to screen out clients better, but the emergencies that I have in my retention agreement are 
the police are at your house. CPS is at your house. Your other, the other parent has said, I'm taking the kids to Florida right now. Not I'm gonna take them to Florida in five months. So very few emergencies. Um, the parent being 10 minutes late to pick up the kid, not an emergency. Or a parent, like I said, not bringing back, that was actually an enforcement once. The, the dad didn't bring back the daughter's swimsuit after, and the mom actually filed an enforcement against him. Even though dad, the minute, the minute he realized it, got a brand new, exact same one, brand new, had it overnighted, still went through with the enforcement. Um, I don't know, it's just, it's family law. So, but you know, that's, and then what I also, when I have my consults with my clients, I explain to them, the courts are only open from like eight to five. And so even if it is a <coughs> true emergency, you know, if it's, if it's an emergency and it happens on the weekend, I can't do anything about it until the court opens. And then even then, depending on what county it's happening on, if, it, if it's something that's in Harris County, you know, an emergency, you're going to get a setting in 30 days. You know, there's no such thing as here's my emergency. I'm filing it on Monday and my, you know, my hearing is on Thursday. You know, that just doesn't happen. Um, some of these, the smaller counties, Fort Bend, you can still get pretty quick settings. Um, Brazoria, you can still get pretty quick settings. But for the most part, you're looking at if, if you're in Harris County, which, you know, takes up a large part of the practice, um, an emergency is going to still be 30 days. And then a lot of these courts make you go to mediation first. So they hear, they don't even want to hear the facts. They just hear that there's a custody dispute. Have y'all mediated? No, go to mediation. Um, and that's because judges know that a majority of cases will resolve at mediation. And so, you know, it's easier to, let's go to mediation. Have your, you know, have your day venting to the mediator and then let's come up with an agreement. Um, and actually, I love mediation. Because you can be creative, you can think you know, you can think outside the box. You're not bound by what the family code says um, or by what you know, whatever the law says. You can do something that works for you. You're also not bound. Some courts, depending, depending on the court, they actually have strict time limits. And you know, when we were in the height of lockdown, when you could watch court hearings online, I'd I'd watch some court hearing, you know, up in the panhandle, and the judge would have them on a on a on a stopwatch. And the attorney would be mid-sentence and the judge is like, okay, you're out of time. And I mean, you know, you, you have to run your court. Otherwise, you have some people that have taken days just telling their story about how their feelings were hurt when they were dating. So, um, but have blocking my time, explaining to clients what constitutes an emergency, um, having a separate cell phone number. You know, th those are like three huge huge things that have made a big difference in my practice. Um, and I talk, I go into more detail about those in my book, um, having the set office hours again, you know, Monday through Thursday, you know, from eight to five, my office is open. You will either find me or my um, paralegal on Fridays. I have my hours is closing at noon. I may, you know, I may still be working, but it's closed at noon as far as, you know, as as far as opposing counsel, as far as clients are concerned. Because um, again, that's time for me to either get work done or just run errands. Or, you know, when I worked at, when we worked at the law firm together, I mean, it wasn't unusual to work late. You'd get there and it's dark outside and you leave home and, you know, you leave to go home and it's dark outside. I mean, you never saw daylight because you lived in the tunnels. You went to the restaurants in the tunnels and so you were never outside getting fresh air. Um, and it wasn't unusual at all to take your work home and still do a little bit of work at home, but you were expected to be back in your desk, you know, at whatever, 9, 9.30 a.m. the next morning. Um, I try to stop working during the week at between five and six o'clock. Um, and it's all just about just, again, setting boundaries because you can't, your client, they're a means to an end, but they're not the end. And so you do your best representing them and, but you still have a life. And so, and that was something that I've learned as well. So I, I do enjoy what I do. I enjoy helping my clients, but when you are burned out and your cup is empty, you know, then you're just going through the motions and not as present to, you know, to help your clients. 
yeah, I was still working on my cases. My clients were still happy. I was still getting good reviews. I was still, um, and I've actually, what I started doing is I print out anytime a client says, thank you so much. You were amazing. I print it out and I tape it to my wall and I'm like, here's my wall. So whenever I'm feeling bad or I'm like, oh, you know, I'll look at, just read it. And it's, you know, and it's nice. Or I had an opposing counsel this morning um, who messaged me and you know, thank you for professionalism because we are still professionals. And, you know, that's, that's a whole other topic for a different day. But, you know, I printed that out. And guess what? That's going to go on my wall. As a reminder, you know, I'm not my client. I'm, I'm a professional. And, you know, again, it's in family law, you, you get that. Um, you know, they say like criminal law, um, your clients are on their best behavior. They're, you know, very pious. And, you know, and then in, because, you know, and then in family law, you have, you know, good people just, acting up um, because of the emotion of the situation. And so I try to be the voice of reason. There's some attorneys who just like to add fuel to the fire because it raises up their legal fees. I'm like, okay, well, let's look at this. Like I had a client once who um, just had some concerns that maybe there was some inappropriate behavior going on with dad and child. I'm like, well, you know, because he always forces her to give him a hug. I'm like, well, let's, you know, what other, what, anything else? Is your daughter exhibiting any changes in her behavior? And her daughter was a school age, elementary school. I'm like, is she exhibiting any changes in her behavior? How is she acting when she comes home from dad? You know, has she has she regressed in anything? Have the teachers noticed anything? Have I said, you know, why don't you, you know, take her to a counselor and just see if she opens up and shares anything? I said, but you're going to blow your case up if I go immediately and file something just based on it makes you uncomfortable that he forces her to give him hugs. So, um, and she did, she followed my advice. We didn't blow the case up. We got it resolved and there was nothing going on with dad and child. So, um, but what her daughter in therapy learned, you know, if you don't want to give somebody a hug, you can say, I don't feel like giving you, a, you know, just learning boundaries, personal space boundaries. Um, but there was nothing. Bruce, you know, they're on their knee and they wanted to go straight to CPS. And I'm like, did you talk to the other parent and ask him what happened? Because, you know, kids rough house and, you know, they fall and get hurt all the time. Um, and she's like, no, not yet. I'm like, why don't you just ask the other parent? Hey, I noticed his knee on Johnny's knee. What happened? You know, and the other parent said, oh, yeah, he was rough housing in the bathroom when he was getting into the tub and he bumped into the cabinet door that was open. Okay, that's reasonable. And I said, you know, just document it. But if you see more bruises every time when he comes home from dad's house or there's you know, more significant injuries or he makes an outcry to you, then we have something that's worth going to the judge, going to CPS, you know, escalating your case. But right now, just, just monitor. Um, that's how I practice. You know, I want to get from A to B as efficiently as possible, but also advocating and representing the client. I don't want, in a family law especially, because there's, it's already high emotion. I don't need to add fuel to the fire just, just for my billables. You know, my practice is 100% word of mouth um, because I treat people the way I would want to be treated if I was the client. Um, I treat their money like it's coming out of my own bank account. And, you know, I think they appreciate that, which is why they refer their friends or, you know, neighbors, colleagues to me. Um, so going back to some of the boundaries. So another boundary on... Um, no unscheduled phone calls. This is also a big one. And, it, and these all, all kind of blend in together. But the no unscheduled phone calls, I, again, I have that. I have a whole little paragraph. You know, I, I typically will just let my phone go to voicemail. And I do this for everybody. Because otherwise, you never get work done. It's just, it's like sitting in front of your email responding all, all day long. If I'm on the phone all day long, I'm never going to get anything done. And I learned that lesson, you know, the hard way by always being I had one client who um, he was texting me at least like 10 times a day and I was always responding. And, and then we would schedule phone calls for either that same day or the very next day. And it just really came home when he complained that I, um, because one time I didn't immediately, respond. this goes back to the instant gratification. Mm -hmm. I didn't immediately respond to a text. And he complained to me that I'm that I'm not giving his case the attention that it that it merits. And I had to go back through and look at, and that's the nice thing about having my Google voice, because it's I can import all of my text messages on a file to that file. 
Um, and I went through and I looked and, you know, and I responded to him. I'm like, we have talked over the past week. We have talked no less than 30 times. Mm-hmm. So I am giving your case even more than enough attention. Um, but I learned from that, that it, you have to respect your own time. And if you don't respect your time, your clients aren't going to respect it. And I now schedule my calls. Again, if it, I try not to schedule it on the days that I've blocked, I'll schedule it on, you know, like I have a lot of phone calls on next Wednesday, but I'm working all day Tuesday and I'm working on, you know, uninterrupted on Thursday. Um, I do hold some, like a doctor's office, they hold some time slots for emergencies. I will hold some time slots, but for the most part, I've learned that you just have to stick with, you know, stick with your rules in order for your peace of mind and sanity. Um, and you know what? I've yet to you know to lose a client because of that. So, and then I have you know mindset matters. Break, breaking the chains to your desk and mindset matters. That that goes also along the lines of just taking a break. You know, go go have lunch. Go outside. Breathe some fresh air. Um, you can, we're not robots. We're not machines where we can just work 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 work. You know, you have to have a break. And then especially like if I've been in mediation all day, my mind is just tired. I, I can't come back and work because I'm like, I'm just dead. I just want to watch Friends or just some TV show that I don't have to think about. Um, and then I'll, you know, regroup the next day. You have to have that mental downtime. And so that also, all of the stuff, these are all things that I wasn't doing. I wasn't getting, taking a break. I was like, I have to work. I have to get up early and work. I have to get this done. Um, I was just around the clock available and you have to have, you know, you have to have your time, your me time. Um, and then, you know, my husband, you know, the hierarchy was work, then our dogs, and then my husband. And so, you know, I'm working on now, you know, working on changing that hierarchy. Um, but I always tell them, like, has anybody who, you know, who has written a book and dedicated it to you? So when he, when he complains, um, but you know, no unscheduled phone calls. I mean, not even the court. If I see the clerk's number, I mean, I might if it's like the clerk, but um, but for the most part, I'm like, no, people can leave messages. And then especially with clients or even opposing counsel, I'm like, well, what are they calling about? Let them leave a message. And then let me look in my file because maybe it's something that, you know, I can quickly just send an email back and respond to. Um, and I tell my clients, I love text because it's easier for me. Like text me, don't call me um, because I can quickly respond to a text. And I typically don't bill for, you know, if it's less than 10, 15 minutes, I'm not going to bill my client for that. Um, Because I can, it's not taking a lot of time away from me just to let me look in the file. Here's the quick response. And then everybody's happy and we go on with what we're doing. Um, But, you know, I'm like, text me. I can answer a text faster. You know, I have it where it goes to my cell phone so I can open the app and check it from there. So I can be in court and be able to respond to somebody. Um, instead of having a long list of emails to respond to or phone calls to return. But for the most part, if someone, if you call me, it's going to go to my voicemail and I will call you back, you know, or schedule a time that we can talk so that we're not playing phone tag. And it's a respect for my time or respect for the client's time or opposing counsel's time. Um, But, and I talk about my meditation and mindfulness practice. And again, that goes into just the whole self-care. When I first started therapy, my therapist asked me about, um, you know, like, what do you do for self-care? I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I get my nails done, I get my hair done. I play with my dogs sometime. Okay. I feed my dogs. You know, that is not self-care. And so, but I just, I'm so used to, you know, you, you're used to doing things for other people that might, well, you know, that, that's like making, looking professional for your work environment or for your, you know, yourself, but it's not truly taking care of yourself. And so over time, my idea of self-care has grown to be um, having a meditation practice. And even it, it's just even just grounding, just breathing from your stomach and breathing out. And it's just that slower pace. Um, and I've been working on that. And the other day with my therapist, we were talking about in order to learn, because a lot of us, we just have shallow breaths and you're not really breathing from the bottom of your stomach. Um, which is what he says you're supposed to do. You just have to remind your body that this is how you're supposed to breathe. He's like, think about breathing from your feet up. 
and it'll help you slow down. It'll help you take those deep breaths, which will help relax your system. Um, and so I try to do that, but when I can't, when I feel too stressed out, I'll just, you know, take a cat nap, a quick 15, 20 minute, even 30 minute nap can do wonders. Um, go outside, sit outside and have lunch, just to be out in the air. Uh, anything other than just sitting and working 24 seven, because you have to have that break. And they talk about it in the airlines where they say, you know, if you're help yourself first, put your face mask on first before you help the next person. Because we help, you know, that's kind of what, what this is. You have to take care of yourself. You have to take care of your mental and emotional self if you want to be effective in helping your clients. Um, if you want to be an effective you know, advocate for them, if you want to, you know, assertively represent your client, um, you know, there's, I always have this thing about being assertive or effective. So I say effectively representing your client. Some people say, you know, they ask for an assertive attorney. And I'm like, well, I mean, do you want somebody who bangs? Because I, I don't, I feel like I'm an effective attorney. I don't, I don't bang my desk. I'm not throwing my phone. I'm not cussing at my opposing counsel um, or cussing out the other party you know, who may be unrepresented. You know, I, I treat everyone with respect. You know, we're, we're all people and we're going through, we're, just, we're trying to reach an agreement or reach some type of resolution. Um, or we go to trial, but you know, you don't have to be a jerk about it. You can still zealously advocate for your client without being a jerk. And I had a case with this one attorney. We were actually co-counsel a few years ago. Um, he cussed out, we both, he cussed out the pro se party at a hearing and was like, I'm gonna, by the time this case is over, I'm gonna know what you had for breakfast today. And then he wanted me to send a an interrogatory asking him what he had for breakfast. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. There is no good faith basis for that. That's not relevant. That's not, you know, no, I, I'm not putting my name on some frivolous interrogatory like that. Um, but what his conduct did, because we were close to reaching an agreement, but he had to pound his chest and show who was boss. It made this man go and hire an attorney and then, you know, it drug the case out even longer and it wound up costing our client even more um, because of, you know, I just, I call it an ego fight, but yes, he did. So there were, we were co-counsel on a couple of cases. This was years ago. Um, and finally I was like, yeah, I just can't, you know, I was building my practice. Um, I'm like, we're done. You know, life is too short. It stresses me out having to work with you and we're on the same side, you know, so I can't even, Imagine what it must be like with, with the other side. And all it does at the end of the day, when you're that, have that type of antagonistic attitude, you're not, you're just harassing the other side and you're running up legal fees. You're not making any type of resolution on the case. Um, so I'm more selective on the type of clients that I accept. I've had some clients who just want to outspend the other side because they make more money. And I'm like, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to send discovery just for the sake or take all these depositions just because I can. If it's not going to lead to something on the case or it's not relevant, then I don't need to, you know, we don't need to do that. Um, I'm not going to file frivolous motions just, just to have something on file. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I look at, and that's kind of the, that's the nice thing about having worked in the civil because we got such good training with that, you know, and I've been able to use <clears throat> just the general civil background with my family practice um but and it also helps you to see the bigger picture you know you don't get caught up in the minutia um so my mindfulness practice now you know i meditate um to go outside and it's also called grounding which i'm not as good at not doing this but like taking your shoes off and just touching the earth and just feel you know just that calmness um i typically don't work on the weekends anymore you know, I, that's my time to just decompress and, you know, I would rather work late one or two nights during the week and have two full days of not having to think about work mm -hmm. where I can just hang out with my husband or hang out with friends and just watch TV, you know, do a Netflix marathon. Um, and so I've, I've gotten, you know, <clears throat> that was another boundary of work, my work days or Monday through Friday. And then I have my weekends, you know, because it takes a good 
at least for me, like Saturday, I may not be working, but I don't really feel relaxed until Sunday. And then Sunday is like our movie Sunday. And I'm like, I want to find a movie on Netflix. And so that's kind of the habit that my husband and I have gotten into. Um, but these are all things that I've done to help me fall back in love with the practice of law, where I don't feel like, you know, screw this, I'm out of here. Um, where's my holy water? And, you know, I, I enjoy my clients and enjoy helping them. So do y'all have any questions? <laughs> yeah, I was looking to see if there was any, you know, I had this, um, I had a paragraph like, tell your loved ones how much you appreciate them. Because my husband read my book and he edited it for me. And he was like, you know, I really think you need it for people who are married to non-lawyers, just so they can get an idea of like, this is the kind of stress that you're under. And, um, and that you do appreciate them, but so they can have just that broader picture of, because it's not just your client, it could be the judge, it could be, you know, your opposing counsel. I mean, there's so many different moving pieces. And so it's, it's learning how to manage all of those moving pieces. And for me, it was the things, like I said, have a separate cell phone. And some, some opposing counsel just get my work cell phone number. They don't get my personal cell phone number. Um, Cause I consider you know, your personal cell phone. If I'm giving you my personal cell phone, that means I trust you not to, you know, text me for rant for stupid stuff. Yeah. I say stupid stuff. Um, over the weekend or, you know, late at night. I mean, I'm giving you some because I trust you with it. Um, and don't give it to, you know, don't give it to your client, but you know, some attorneys just, they just, get the work cell phone number. They don't get my personal cell phone number. Um, but having that, having the set hours, having the, for the most part, I would say probably 90% of my phone calls, I'll just let it go to voicemail. And then I'll, I'll just have my you know, legal assistant, paralegal return the calls for me and schedule it. And that way it avoids people paying that tag. Mm -hmm. um, I try to respect other attorneys' times as well. I'll send them an email saying, hey, can you let me know what days you're, you're available next week? so that we can talk and that way we're not playing phone tag because it is a waste of time if I'm calling them and I get their voicemail or have to talk to their assistant and then they call me back and you know and either they're not there or it's just going to my voicemail um not working late in the evenings anymore not working on the weekends I don't even do consults on the weekends when I first started I did and it never worked out you know it's what we call tire kickers people who just wanted to get free legal advice but they either couldn't afford it or they just were exploring their options and I'm like, okay, well, you can explore your options. And during the work hours, Monday through Friday, I'm not going to come up to my office anymore and get dressed up, you know, to meet with you. Um, so that was, you know, these are just a lot of this was trial and error. But the things that I talk in here are from learning from my therapist. Um, you know, I say in here, and I yesterday when I was telling him about speaking today, I'm like, and how many people have said they thought they won the lottery, you know, from your treatment? So. Yeah, I can't say enough good things about getting therapy. There's, if you want to call it life coaching or therapy, whatever, you know, seems more palatable um, or whatever's more socially acceptable, then call it whatever you want to, just as long as you're getting the help. So, and then, you know, I had a list that I wanted of qualities I was looking for in a therapist. And um, I got, that's why I say I feel really lucky that I found this therapist. He was just up the road, even though I do Zoom for the convenience factor. Um, so, yeah, there's no shame in getting help. Um, there's some days where I feel like I'm awesome. I don't need help anymore. I don't need to talk to anybody. And then there's other days where, you know, you just feel like, um, you know, what, what do they say? It's like, you know, two steps forward and three steps back. Mm -hmm. But the good thing is that I've learned how to stop that spiral. And it, I stop myself, I breathe, I'll go meditate. Um, I'll just get up and take a walk. And whereas before, you know, I just, I just didn't know. I didn't know how to, you just get stuck in the whole negative mindset. So anyway, that is it. That is my book, Judge Me Not. You can get it on Amazon as a Kindle or a hard copy. It's also available in the law library um, as a reference guide. And, you know, on page 33, I talk about when I was up here doing research. Awesome. Well, let me let me do a little closing here. Just to one, thank you 
for this. Uh, you know, I, I, was, I practiced law for a long time, too, and I was able to uh, find something that utilized my skills as a lawyer and get to do something different that is more beneficial for me. So maybe that was my version of therapy coming to do to this job. Um, you know, it really, I don't know, everything you said really resonated. You know, it's uh, for anything, for any, no matter what your job is, you know, of keeping things in perspective, setting boundaries, all that stuff. And it's not selfishness by setting boundaries. It's, it's better for everybody, you know, better how you do your job better. It's better for you personally and so forth. So it's just all these, you know, the other things you said, like walking, you know, walking is great therapy, you know, just in and of itself, whether you listen to music while you do it, whether you just, you know, walk around and plus you get exercise, you know, so it's just a lot of what you said. And one, it takes guts to come and, and, and do this and, and say this. And, you know, like you said, admit certain things. It's not like you're admitting anything negative, but society kind of views those things is negative, you know, that, you know, we need help. Sometimes we need a different perspective. We need someone, you know, just, just to tell us some coping, not say coping skills, but things you can do to make your life better, you know, to help you through that. Because I think, you know, lawyers aren't all the same mentality, but lawyers who are want to do a good job are somewhat of a similar mentality. And it's hard to turn things off sometimes because the stakes are often very high, whether it's someone's family situation that's a very high stake whether it's you're representing a client who has millions of dollars at stake in litigation or whatever it's it's important what you're doing and uh and sometimes it's hard to turn that off and say well i'm i'm gonna go watch a movie you know well you do have to turn it off because you won't be effective at what you're doing so just a long way of saying just a lot of what you said is still applies to everybody and definitely applies to a lot of lawyers and so forth it's a challenging field uh and that you took the time to write a book, that you took the time to uh, come and speak to us, and that you had the guts to do that for yourself, too, you know. So thank you for, again, lecturing with us uh, here today for our attorney lecture series. And I hope uh, everybody out there gets a uh, benefit from what uh, Cindy had to say. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me. You betcha. All right. For some time to turn these things on. How do you stop recording? Do you know? Um, in the middle. Oh, is it the right? Oh, yeah, there it is. Got it. Or the on the right side? Will that work? That's good. Oh.